I turned my basement from this unfinished space to this rental apartment in two months. I did the vast majority of the work, including the framing, the plumbing, the flooring, and I even built the kitchen cabinets from scratch. I broke this video up into chapters, so if you want to skip to a specific part, just check the description and I'll have timestamps there. I want to start by saying I'm not a general contractor, I'm more of a woodworker, and I just really like to work with my hands. So if there's something you notice that I could be doing better, let me know. I want to hear about it in the comments, because we're all here to learn from each other. This video is in chronological order, so let's start with the framing. Framing a basement wall is not complicated at all. I start by marking where all my studs go, which are every 16 inches, and then I transfer that mark to both the bottom and top plates. Then I lay the wall out and nail it all together. It's as simple as that. If it's a two x four wall, each stud gets two nails. If it's a two x six wall, each stud gets three. After completely building the wall, you then stand it up, slide it into place, and anchor it down. I use a framing nailer anywhere there's a wood on wood connection, but for anything with concrete, I used a ram set, but if you don't have that, you can use tap cons. And once I got all the walls in place, I added the double top plate. Here I'm making a header, which is used to span a gap where there's gonna be a window or a doorway. There are a couple different ways to frame a wall, and the more traditional method is what you saw me do earlier, which is framing it on the ground and then standing it up. The other method is framing it in place, and that's what you see me doing here. While it's a lot quicker to build the wall on the ground and then stand it up, I actually recommend building in place if you're framing a basement for various different reasons, space being the largest one. If you want to see my full length video on how to frame a basement, I go a lot more in depth and I'll have a link to that in the description. After the framing was done, I then added an egress window so that this room could legally qualify and meet code requirements to be a bedroom. The opening for my egress window had to be at max 44 inches off the ground, so I had to dig down about 18 inches or so, and then I built a retaining wall so that the window could be where I needed it. I used your average landscaping bricks to build this and construction adhesive to help hold it together, and then I used some river rock behind to help with drainage. Next, I needed to cut a hole in the wall for the window. A sawzall got me through the siding just fine, but I had to rent a 14 inch concrete saw to cut through the foundation wall. And unfortunately, I returned the saw before I actually got the slab out and it took me forever to actually get it out. And I tried everything, but don't worry, I got it. Hooray! As you can see here, I framed out the window with pressure treated lumber and then I used flashing tape around the edges. To attach the pressure treated lumber, I used a framing nailer and a ram set with construction adhesive. Then I came back with some spray foam and made sure that all of the gaps were filled around it. And then I could set the window in place and fasten it down, for which I'm using inch and a half roofing nails. Then I needed to trim it out, so I used a concrete blade in my circular saw because cement board will destroy a regular saw blade. And then I used a multi-tool to get into the corners. Then I added the rest of the roofing nails because I wasn't able to get every single one in earlier. And I moved on to flashing the window. To start, I added Tyvek tape around the window to help ensure a watertight seal. And before I added the brick mold, I used a piece of flashing and slid it up under the siding and over the top of that brick mold. Then I could finish trimming out the rest of the window. And to attach that brick mold, I'm using a 16 gauge finish nailer. And the last thing we need to do for the window is add a bead of caulk around the top and the sides. But we don't actually want to caulk the bottom because if water does happen to get behind the window, we want a way for that water to escape so that it doesn't rot the wood. Now that that's in, let's do the plumbing. I initially didn't think I was going to have to do almost any work on these drains because my basement was already plumbed for a bathroom when I bought the house. But upon further inspection, I found that all of the drains were actually in the wrong spot. For example, this toilet drain was 18 inches off the wall, and what you see it at now is 13. So the aggravating thing here is that I already had functional drains, but I still had to cut into the concrete and move them. Okay, pardon the mess. So we got the sink just there, dishwasher just to the side of it. Right there is the uh, ice maker for the fridge. 
Here's the bathroom. You got the vanity, the hookups for the washer and dryer, the drain, dryer vent, and then we got the shower. And behind this bucket, it's a toilet. Got the bathroom all stubbed out. Got the new water heater installed. With all my water lines and drains run, I could then move on to actually installing things like the shower pan. So I'm using a sand mix here to help set the shower pan, and this is gonna practically eliminate any of that creaking as you shift your weight in the shower. So once you get that in and you get the drain in, level it out and then don't touch it for a full day. Let's talk really quick about electrical. This was actually a fairly easy job because it's a very small one bedroom apartment and I planned for all of the large appliances to be very close to each other and very close to the panel. I'm not gonna go super into detail about how I did the electrical because I'm not super knowledgeable about it and I don't feel like I could teach people how to do it. My neighbor came over and helped me with the electrical and I was more of his assistant while he did most of the work. One thing I do want to mention is that while I do have a 200 amp service, the wire running from a meter base to my panel are actually not a thick enough gauge to carry all 200 amps. So I only have 150 amps. And since I don't have gas, all of my appliances and the appliances in the rental unit are all electric. And 150 amps is not nearly enough for essentially what is two houses. So I hired an electrician to come and upgrade my service from two to 400 amps, install a new meter base for that, and also run a secondary main panel to my basement. I hate cockroaches, and I'm new to Georgia, but they're a problem here. So before the drywall went up, I put boric acid on all of the bottom plates everywhere there was framing. It's only a few bucks a bottle, so I got four bottles, and it was plenty for the entire apartment. Got the shower insert installed. You can see right there. I basically got everything done that needs to happen before drywall, except for the insulation and some of the soundproofing. So let's jump into that. I'm using two types of insulation here. For these exterior walls, I'm using fiberglass insulation because it has a higher R value. And it's important to note that there already is fiberglass insulation in the ceiling. And in addition to that, I'm doing a layer of rock wool, which is really good for soundproofing. There were three main things that I did to soundproof my basement. And these three were rock wool in the ceiling, sound isolation clips, and two sheets of 5 8 drywall as opposed to one sheet of half inch. Again, I have a full video on this where I go very in depth into all of these different aspects of soundproofing and I'll have a link to that in the description as well. And in just a minute, I'm gonna play a before and after for you so you could see how well this worked. It's about 2 a.m., just finished insulation, super tired, but so far this has been one of the most satisfying and itchy things along this entire process because I can finally start seeing the walls take shape. I can actually see the bathroom for what it is. There's only one wall that I can't insulate yet. That's because we haven't totally finished electrical and that's this guy. Just a couple things left like we got to wire up a ceiling fan and a couple switches. So, a little update for you. Here I'm installing the sound isolation clips and you install these every two feet when you're going vertical and every four feet when you're going horizontally. Then you clip in this hat channel and the drywall gets screwed to this instead of the studs and it stops a lot of the sound transfer. I finally have everything done. We are ready for drywall. I got all the plumbing, all the framing, the electrical, the soundproofing, the HVAC, the insulation, everything done. You can see the rock wool in the ceiling and in the bathroom. You can see the sound isolation clips all on all of the exterior walls. So drywall is coming tomorrow, but we'll see where we are after that. Here's a quick sound test of both before and after I did all of the soundproofing, playing the same song and having the same people walking in the same spot. Yeah. 
these soundproofing methods got an A plus rating in my book because the footsteps are one of the most annoying sounds you have to deal with when people live above you, and they completely excelled in that regard. I was originally planning on doing the drywall myself because it's something that I know how to do, and I typically go that route if it means I can save a lot of money. But unfortunately, I just didn't have the time for it, and if I wanted to meet my deadline, I had to hire something out, and that was probably the most labor intensive. So for the amount of time that it would have taken me versus how much I had to pay, that was the first thing to go. But just because you're hiring a contractor doesn't mean you have to do it a super expensive way. For example, I supplied the drywall. I ordered it, I had it delivered here, and then I manually carried all of it down to the work site. Then I had the crew come in, hang it, and mud it. So now that the drywall's done, I moved on to hanging the doors. I had a total of seven doors in this apartment. Five were interior and two were exterior. The five interior were just your typical hollow core interior doors. For some background info, this apartment is only about half of my unfinished basement and the other half is my wood shop. So for soundproofing reasons, I used an exterior door, which actually has weather stripping on all four sides, including a threshold on the bottom and it has a solid foam core. And that's what you see me installing right now. The soundproofing stuff that I did really gave me a lot of different challenges. For example, this wall has two layers of 5 8 drywall instead of a typical half inch layer. And so the door actually had to be trimmed out with quarter round before I could even put the trim around the door. And that was kind of the last thing to do after having all the doors installed was to trim everything out. I needed to put some trim around the windows as well. If you wanna see the full video of all of this, I'll have a link to that in the description and I go a lot more in depth because I have a lot more time to. The last thing I wanted to do before paint was built-ins. And I did built-ins in the master closet, the pantry, and the laundry room. If there's ever a time to do built-ins, it's before you paint. And that's because painting these built-ins, you don't even have to think about. You just prime them and paint them at the same time as all of your walls. Super easy. These built-ins look pretty complicated, but I guarantee they're super easy. In fact, I did all of the built-ins in this entire basement, start to finish in five hours. I started by using a router and a three quarter inch bit to cut a dado for all of these shelves to slide in. And then I used glue and brad nails to fasten them together after I flipped this on its side. After getting one side done, I then worked on the other side by adding glue, clamping it in place, and then brad nailing it together as well. After fitting it into place, I noticed that it needed something, and so I decided to cut a 45 degree angle off the top, and that definitely gave me what I was looking for. And to attach these to the walls, I'm just screwing them directly into the studs, and then I did the same thing for the other side. I also created a shelf that spans between these two cabinets, and that's where the closet rod is going to sit underneath. Then I just polished it up with some quarter round. It's extremely easy to create shelves for the pantry and the laundry room. I first cut two inch strips and then I used construction adhesive and finish nails to attach those to the wall. Then I used construction adhesive or glue because I ran out and added a shelf and nailed it to those supports. You don't have to worry about finding studs. The construction adhesive is what's really giving this its strength. Those nails are just holding it there in place. And I did the same thing to the pantry. If you want to see a more in-depth video, I'll have a link to that in the description as well. Now that was the last thing that needed to happen before I could paint in the apartment, so let's get down to business. After doing all of the drywall, there's a ton of leftover dust and residue that needs to be removed in order for the paint to go on well. So I used this dust mop to get rid of that. It's not an ideal tool, but it worked. Enough. You're probably thinking to yourself right now, what's going on? What am I feeling? I don't know, but I kind of like it. What can I say? I just have that effect on people. To paint this apartment, I used a Wagner Control Pro 190. Now, I'm no painter, so take what I say with a grain of salt, but the tip this came with was a 517, and I found that it was leaving streaks because the paint was super thick and it wasn't coming out with enough pressure. So I got another 515 tip and then I had a much better experience after that. 
And as you can see, my father-in-law is back rolling behind me after I spray, and that's going to ensure that primer really sticks to the drywall. And as you can tell, I never miss an opportunity to smile for the camera. If you think this video isn't terrible, you should subscribe. I have a lot of things on my channel that aren't terrible. I was sick and tired of not having light in the basement, and so the very first thing that I did was take down all of the masking around the windows, and I also took the masking tape out of the outlets and cleared those of excess drywall mud while I was at it. Then my neighbor came back over to help me install these LED lights, which are canless and super easy. You'll notice that these lights are actually on the smaller side, and that's because a smaller hole means better soundproofing. And like it was said on the first day, let there be light. Which I guess confused my camera's autofocus so much that it went into rave mode. Getting those lights in was a game changer. Things went on hyper speed because I no longer had to lug around a ton of floodlights. Now let's talk about flooring. I used LVP or luxury vinyl plank for the kitchen slash living area. And I used a two inch hexagonal tile for the bathroom. This really isn't a complicated room to install LVP in. It's mostly square with 145 degree angle and just has a small pantry. I started laying the LVP at around 5 o'clock in the afternoon and I didn't finish until about 3 a.m. And my neighbor was here for about half that amount of time. So in total, it was about 15 man hours to do this. My guess is that you could probably do it faster because we were pretty slow, but it is definitely something that a beginner DIYer could do. After laying this LVP down in my kitchen slash living area, the best advice that I have is to buy a quality product. I bought what was practically the cheapest and thinnest LVP that you can buy, and that was a terrible mistake. The reason being, with a cheaper LVP, it's a lot more fragile, and so when you're trying to get it in place, if things aren't going really easily, it has a tendency to crack, and that just makes it a lot more difficult to install. Not only do you have more waste because boards crack and break, but it also leaves you with worse seams because you're afraid to really put force on that joint because it might break. So that's my one piece of advice is don't go with the cheapest stuff. I'm never going to buy cheap LVP again. This was only about 260 a square foot. I would probably wouldn't buy something that's under $3. Tiling the bathroom ended up being quite a chore. My big mistake was not masking the ground when I painted the apartment. So I had a ton of overspray that would just be terrible to tile on top of. So I spent about two hours grinding it off. I used these two inch hexagonal tiles on mesh backing. I'm using a diamond back sliding tile saw to cut my tile and it did work really well. This is a Harbor Freight brand, but it did everything I needed it to do and the cuts were really accurate. The only times I needed to use the tile saw was to square up an edge to fit up next to the drywall. To install these tiles, I'm using a pre-mixed thin set and a quarter inch trowel. The most important thing that I would say about laying tile down would be using the trowel properly and making sure that you have the right amount of thin set before you lay the tile down. This is likely less of an issue for larger format tiles because there's hardly any gaps and you can clean out those gaps. But it's a big issue when you're using these tiny two inch hexagonal tiles because there's tons of different gaps between the tiles. And so having excess thin set is going to seep up into those cracks and you're just going to have to clean it up later once it dries. I also recommend tiling your entire room in one day because if you don't, then you're not going to have time to go back and adjust previous tiles that you've already laid because they're already dried. I gave the tile a full day to dry and then I came back to grout and I'm using a pre-mixed grout here and the big thing you want to focus on is making sure that you're really working the grout into all the cracks. So come at it from different angles and really push it in there. And make sure to wipe off any excess grout and remove as much of the haze as you can while it's still wet because it's really hard to remove afterwards. And with this as well, if you want to see the full video on tiling, I'll have a link in the description. Since I enjoy woodworking, I decided to build the kitchen cabinets myself. I built the cabinets out of three quarter inch cabinet grade radiata pine, and I used maple for the face frames. To cut my pieces for the different cabinet carcasses, drawers, and whatnot, 
I used a combination of my Craig AccuCut jig for my circular saw and my table saw. These cabinets are going together with glue, brad nails, and then inch and a quarter pocket screws from Craig. Before assembling, I used my router table to cut a dado for the back panel to slide into, and it's not going to get glued, but this top stretcher will hold it in place. Then I add another stretcher piece on the top front, and then one on the bottom and on the top of the back to help with rigidity. And for the toe kick, I just glued and brad nailed it on. Just like with the cabinet carcasses, I cut dados into the drawer pieces before I assembled it so that I could slide in the bottom panel. Then I used brad nails to hold it together and finish it off with the pocket screws. To build the face frames, I wanted to go with something that was going to be sturdy and hold up over time and really handle abuse. So I chose maple, which is a hardwood, and it's going to do a good job of that. And I assembled it with pocket screws. Because the cabinets are going to be painted, I get the luxury of just brad nailing these face frames on because I can fill the holes and the paint is going to completely hide the nails. If you weren't painting and you were just going to finish this, you might want to use a pin nailer or just glue and clamp it on. To build the shaker style doors, I used the router table to route a quarter inch groove in all of the rails and styles. Then I took all of the rails back to the router table and cut a tenon on both ends. It's important to only do this to the rails, not the styles. And these doors are extremely easy to put together if you did everything properly. I didn't even need to use clamps because they fit together so well, and then I just wiped off excess glue and set it to dry. To paint the cabinets, I'm using my Wagner Flexio, which I really enjoy using. I sprayed one coat of a high quality primer and then one coat of cabinet, door, and trim enamel by Bear. I really like this paint. It's self leveling so it's easy to apply and get a good finish and it's also really durable and is easy to clean. You're definitely going to want some help when installing cabinets so somebody can hold them up while you screw it in place or vice versa. Start with the uppers so that you have room to work and then once those are in you could put in the lowers. To attach these to the wall, I'm using 3 inch GRK cabinet screws. They have a really large head and they're also self pre-drilling. And attaching the lowers was very much the same thing, but a lot easier since we didn't have to carry them over our heads. We just put them in place and then attach them to the studs. As you can see with the masking on the wall, I had to do a little bit of touch up paint because there were a couple cabinets where I accidentally didn't paint the sides or some places that I just needed to touch up in general. But with that done, I installed all of the doors, drawers, and shelves and got everything looking good. If you're going to be building any cabinets, I recommend going with soft closed drawer slides. They really add a nice feel and they're also very cheap to purchase. They're not much more expensive than their non soft closed counterparts. As of now, I haven't uploaded the full video on doing these cabinets, but when it is, I'll have that in the description. Since I have to work at night and on the weekends, it took me about a month to build these cabinets. I priced out this kitchen if I were to buy cabinets, and it would have been about $5,000 for the entire kitchen. And I spent $2,000 on materials and a few tools in order for me to build them. These cabinets that were $5,000 and are commonly used in new builds everywhere, are made out of half inch particle board and they're not super nice. So not only did I save a few thousand dollars by building them myself, but they're built out of three quarter inch plywood and solid maple face frames. Those cabinets are gonna outlive my children. Baseboards are often installed before you paint the house. And I don't know if I'm alone in this or not, but there's nothing that I hate more than the look of quarter wrap. So I waited until after my flooring was in and done before I did this. It did mean that I had to paint it separately, but that really was not a big deal with my Flexio sprayer. Now the apartment was practically finished and the only things I had left to do were things like the plumbing and mechanical trim out and then to install appliances. Since this is now a long term and not a short term rental, I didn't have to furnish the apartment, but I did want to make sure I had all the appliances in there, including a washer and dryer, which is fairly atypical for a long term rental. With the inside of the apartment done, I had one thing left to do that I've been dreading. My tenants needed a place to park their vehicle and they also needed a way to get to their apartment since their entrance is at the back of my house. So the next thing I did was pour a 10 by 30 driveway pad and a 100 foot long walkway around to the back of my house. 
It took four full days to do all of this concrete work, and when I say full, I mean 10 to 14 hour long days. To break this out, I spent the first, second, and third days digging and building the forms, and then the fourth day pouring and finishing the concrete. To make matters worse, I only had two or three hours of time in the first three days that it wasn't raining. So the only footage that I have from this project was removing some of the sod. All the rental equipment and materials like the concrete together added up to $2,000. And if I were to have hired a contractor, it would have been between six and $8,000 for this. Here's the driveway pad in the front. It's 10 feet wide and roughly 30 feet long. At its thinnest point, it's four inches thick, and at its thickest point, it's about 10. And here's the walkway around to the back. It's three feet wide, 100 feet long, and about three and a half inches thick. I used fiber reinforced 3000 PSI concrete with rebar throughout. You guys, that's it. It's done. Roll the after footage. Now there are a few other things that I didn't have the footage or the time to talk about in this video. The first of those is the HVAC and that's something that I couldn't do myself and so I had to hire it out. I got a two ton unit which is perfect for this basement and it has two zones, one for the apartment and one for my wood shop. I really wanted to do something unique like concrete countertops, but we just didn't have the time because it takes about a full month for that to cure before you can even seal it. So we ended up going with a quartz countertop, which we really like. And the last thing I can think of that I might get asked about is this carpet in the bedroom. That's something I didn't do myself because it really just didn't make much sense. When you purchase carpet from say Home Depot, the price includes installation, and if you take installation out of the price, it really doesn't decrease very much. So it wasn't worth it to me. If you're curious about the costs of everything I did in the basement apartment, go ahead and let me know in the comments because I'm thinking I might make a video just breaking all of that down and going over what I paid. So let me know if that sounds interesting. <sighs> I'm finally done. This is the moment I have been waiting for for about three months as I've been building this. I haven't been uploading a ton of videos, I know that, I'm sorry, but I have basically been working down here about 12 hours a day after working a full shift at work. So I've been crazy busy, but now it's finally done and I think it looks great. The saddest part about this is that somebody moves in tomorrow. So I'm not really gonna see this place very much for the next year and a half until their lease is over. Thank you to all of my subscribers that have been here from the very beginning when I started three years ago. And for those of you that haven't subscribed yet, I hope this video was informationable or enjoyable enough for you to do that. Time for me to go into hibernation. If you don't hear from me for the next couple weeks, I'll probably just be asleep, so don't worry too much. A quick thank you to my father-in-law, Rob, and also my neighbor, Brendan, who were more than willing to help me on multiple occasions, especially when it came to the concrete. That was a terrible day, and I'm glad I had someone to commiserate with. You guys that work in concrete, I don't envy you. At all.